So you are at Clearing the Clouds, Rapture Realities, as Nathan has mentioned. I am your host, Andrew Brown. I hope uh, you will find this time entertaining. Does anyone else need an outline? Hope you find this entertaining and educational. Before I begin, I have a confession to make to you guys that I actually believed the rapture. The pre-trib, pre-millennial rapture. Darby Schofield, Left Behind series, everything. So I believe that, and I guess it's up to you uh, here today to judge whether I believe the rapture anymore or not. Because... Yeah, it's up to you. Um, as I think about this topic, I, and I want to compare some biblical passages. And getting into when you're dealing with a technical study like this, I am reminded when, of a situation that I was in in college where I was involved in Campus Crusade for Christ with the leadership team and I helped put on some activities called Christianity on Trial. And this was an outreach where we actually put Christianity on the uh, witness stand and threw questions at it. And one of the outreaches that we had was uh, Christianity on Trial. And we had an atheist come in and they debated between Christianity and not Christianity. And one of the things that this professor brought up was discrepancies within the Gospels. And he had made this huge thing with it, with, that in the Gospel of Matthew, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there you have a resurrection of the saints who actually were resurrected and they went into the holy city. He brought up that this event is only in Matthew. It is left out of Mark, Luke, and John. And because he saw that discrepancy, he thought that was a contradiction and that something so extraordinary would be in all four Gospels. Well, what he did not realize is that the Gospels are not identical accounts. Every event stands on their own. And even when we compare the Gospels, all Gospels are written for a specific purpose and can give details about the events, although the full picture is still hard to put together. So you still have a hard time putting together that full picture. You get a fuller picture, but you still have a hard time getting the exact details down. Let me give you an example of this. You have the temptations of Christ in the Gospels. It is in Matthew and Luke. And there, there are specific reasons for why they're only in those Gospels, whatever. But when you compare specifically Matthew and Luke, you see that the orders of those temptations are different. If you were to label them, it goes 1, 2, 3, or 1, 3, 2. And this is not a contradiction. This is just more details that after the 40 years that Christ was tempted in the wilderness, he this, it gives the account after the 40 days he was being tempted by Satan. And this actually, the two different Gospels gives us six different temptations of our Lord. And it sees that Satan is actually focusing on minor differences, but he continuously does that same temptation. And how often is Satan even successful in tempting all of us when he does it time and time and time again? We grow weak and falter. You can see when we compare the denials of Jesus, it is in, you have three in all four Gospels, but guess what? All three of those separate threes are a little different, and you can actually realize when comparing them that Peter denied the Lord three times before the rooster crowed once, and he denied the Lord three times before the rooster crowed twice. Or you can even think of an example of Jesus walking on water. If you were just looking at Mark, Luke, and John, you would miss out on Matthew's very important detail, which is 
Peter walked on water. The other Gospels do not mention anything about Peter walking on water. So by comparing all these different events and putting them together, we get a more clearer picture when we actually see that Jesus walked out on the water. Not that the other Gospels were wrong, they just did not add that detail. Or we can even see the, the women at the tomb. Every Gospel gives a different scenario to get that full picture. And that is a really, really difficult one. Nathan and I have actually changed our ideas a couple times and debated it again and again and again to see if it makes the most sense. And we think we have the best right now in regard to that. So when we put things together, that is hard to get that full picture. So as we move on, I want to bring up the Messiah prophecies. And we just had that great talk uh, just about Jesus and the prophecies beforehand. And focusing on Jesus' first coming, hindsight is really 2020. But beforehand, there was a lot of confusion in regard to this. And let me give you an example. Isaiah 53, 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet, at, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So if there was no deceit or violence in his mouth, why did the Messiah die a wicked death? Why did he die the death of the wicked? Why was he given an honorary rich man's burial? And for that matter, how could the Messiah God die? Well, let's look at this. Even with the Messiah being God, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government and of peace. So, how could a child be called Mighty God and the Eternal Father? How could there be no end to his peaceful government and he die? So when we think about this, they didn't know because it was beforehand, whereas hindsight's 2020. So they came up with a two messiahs theory, that you have a messiah ben Joseph and a messiah ben David. And this is that you have a suffering messiah and then you have a reigning messiah. Are there two messiahs? No. But even John the Baptist was confused in regard to this when he didn't see Christ reigning as that Messiah. Are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Even John the Baptist was confused. So when we look at the second coming of Jesus Christ, it is equally difficult to pinpoint the exact details. But we're going to try. So establishing some facts here. He will return. Acts 1, 11, This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So Jesus had, this is at the ascension. He is gone up, and he's going to come back in the same way. We also need to take note that Christ returns after the Great Tribulation, and he destroys the Antichrist and his army. We can see that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming or parousia there. So Christ returns after the tri great tribulation. Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years. We see this, that those who are resurrected at the second coming will reign with Christ for a thousand years. And Revelation 25 and 6 basically says exactly that. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So those three facts we need to have before we move on. And as we move on, we need to look at the parousia. This word, without a doubt, is connected with the rapture. But we need to take note that there is already a Greek word for coming, which is erkomai. There's already a Greek word for coming. And since, we have to take note, since Jesus has ascended to heaven, he will come back, which that coming results in his parousia. 
but parousia does not mean coming. Parousia was wrongly translated coming 20 out of 22 times. The King, J the King James translators who held the amillennialist view translated this word not to contradict their beliefs. What is the amillennial amillennialist view? That Christ came, comes back and he uh, destroys the wicked, raises the dead, the wicked go to hell, the righteous go to heaven, and the, it's the end of the world. They did not believe in the thousand year kingdom, which we talked about in some previous talks. So they translated this word according to their beliefs. Parousia has no English equivalent word. It must be transliterated. So that as we analyze this word, parousia is a compound word coming from para and usia. Para means beside or with, and usia means being. So we get being beside or being with. That would be personal presence. However, there is a Greek, another Greek word for personal presence, and that is parimi. Therefore, parousia must mean more than personal presence. And it is a technical word meaning one is present for who he is and what he does. So let us compare parimi and parousia. So as we compare Parimi and Parousia, I notice that every single one of you is Parimi present because you are personally present right here and right now. However, we are at the Word of Truth Bible Conference. So I am calling on your Parousia, and you guys have done a pretty good job as Bible students before, so I'm calling on your Parousia to be here personally present for Bible students. To study your Bibles. However, if let's say we have the front desk lady or a, uh, a waiter or someone bringing in water or cookies and they come in, they are personally present here parimi, but they are not here for who and what they are as the Word of Truth, Truth Ministry Bible students. They are personally present, but they are not parousia present. They are just here in body and they will soon be out of here. But we need to prove this definition just more than just outside of this word, breaking up the word and looking at it. Let's prove it by some context. And we can prove the definition by the first occurrence of this word in Scripture, and that is Matthew 24, 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your parousia? and the end of the age. So they are asking for the sign of his parousia. And we need to take note that as they ask him for the sign of his parousia, they did not know that he was leaving. Because after, when he told them he was leaving, they were flipping out and distraught and all of that because they didn't know. So the disciples didn't know that he was leaving, so they didn't know he was coming. Equally important, Christ was personally present with them. So you can't ask, you can't have the disciples asking them what's the sign of your personal presence when he, his personal presence was right there in front of them. So let's look at the background. And verses 1 and 2, you know, verse 1, they're bragging about the temple buildings, like, oh, look at this, look at that. These buildings were so great. And Jesus in verse 2 said, all these will be thrown down. Not one stone will be left standing. So as he tells that, then they ask that question. What is the sign of your parousia? So what do they mean? They mean, when are you going to start acting like a king? When are you going to stop fooling around? And when are you going to start being personally present for the reigning Messiah that you are? Going on to another proving the definition, we have the transfiguration of our Lord with Moses and Elijah. And in 2 Peter 1, Peter actually is talking about the transfiguration there. And we see in Matthew 17, 9, tell the vision to no one. So we realize that the transfiguration was a vision, was this vision of the past or of the future. 
of the future. And let's see how Peter describes it. Peter describes himself as an eyewitness of the parousia at the transfiguration. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So this had nothing to do with his return. This had nothing to do with Christ's coming. This was the thousand years. This was the thousand year reign on earth. So when even we get this extra detail for a fuller picture in Luke 9.31, appearing in glory, they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So what exactly happened at this transfiguration? You have Moses, you have Elijah, and they were speaking with Jesus in the thousand years when Christ was reigning on earth for that thousand years they were speaking with him and they were speaking about the past his death burial and resurrection to our lord which i think is very logical to think about because when we see the lord and we are hanging out with him would not that be something we'd want to talk to him about so moses and elijah did the same thing as we continue on proving the definition there are two, remember those two passages that weren't translated coming by the translators. And guess what? Both of them prove the definition. Because we start up in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, For they say his, wet, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. So here they are forced to translate it personal presence. Paul lacked the body and physical appearance the Corinthians imagined in a Greek orator. Apparently, the apostles' parousia wasn't impressive enough for them. They loved the superficial. So, <laughs> yeah. Philippians 2.12, the other one, the other passage that is not translated coming. So then, my brethren, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So here, note that presence and absence are translated, are, are contrasted in this passage. So we have presence, parousia, and absence, apousia. So with being is translated from being. And this <laughs> proves that this, this is like a passage that forces your translation with being and from being. And it proved their bias. So other parousia facts about the second coming, we see in Matthew 24, 27, there's actually four parousia words in that chapter. But for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so the parousia of the Son of Man will be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So the parousia is sudden, it is public, and it is not secret. And with the reference to the corpse and the vultures, we see uh, foreshadowing of the coming battle at the start of the parousia. The Antichrist is killed by the Lord's parousia. We saw that quoted earlier in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. And in 2 Thessalonians 2 9, we actually see that the Antichrist has his own personal presence. He has his own parousia. And that is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. So we see that uh, the Antichrist is going to be personally present for who and what he is and uh, filled with the activity of Satan. We see that there is a resurrection at his parousia in 1 Corinthians 15 23, resurrection from the resurrection chapter and totally applicable to um, our friend that we prayed for beforehand. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his parousia, then the end after the thousand years. So here we see all three lined up. We see Christ the first fruits being a resurrection in the kingdom. We see at the parousia 
a resurrection, and we see then the end after the thousand years. So all three resurrection orders right there. And we also see in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, saying, where is the promise of his parousia? In 2 Peter 3, 4. And this is not them mocking the second coming of Christ. This is actually them mocking that Christ is actually going to reign on earth, like an amillennialist view is a mocker of that. And we actually see a lot of people in their mentality, and even within Christianity, are kind of have that a little bit in their head, not thinking that Christ can reign on earth, right? They think in order for Christ to get the victory, he needs to take everybody off and go to heaven. But the, the truth of the matter is from Scripture, Jesus is going to get the victory here on earth. That everything we see here, although he might look like he's losing, well, he's not really playing by their rules. He is going to change this world. So now as we go on to the premier passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and I call this the premier passage because without a doubt, this without this passage, there is no doctrine. There is no rapture doctrine. And why do I say that? I say that because there are other passages, I understand, but this is the main one. And if you understand this passage, then it really could collapse other views in regard to that, or the other passages. You could just find out later what they mean. But this is the main one, and even was so with myself. So as we look at it, verses 13 and 14, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you do, will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. So the, the-, the Thessalonians were struggling with death. Death of their friends, death of their families. And Paul doesn't want them to be uninformed about those who are asleep, asleep in death, using death as a figure for sleep. And when we realize, and this is good advice even for ourselves, when a loved one of us dies who is in Christ, we should not grieve as the rest who have no hope because we, believing in Christ, have hope. So we are not those who don't have hope when we believe. So we can see, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if you are a believer, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So we're going to analyze God will bring. That word bring is the Greek word ago. And it can mean bring or lead, but it often has a presentation implied. There is a presentation implied in it. Let me give you an example. In John 19, Pilate brings, leads forth, or presents Jesus to the crowd. He brings him forth. He leads him forth. He presents him to the crowd. And that crowd was chanting, crucify, 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 right? And that's Pilate bringing forth Jesus. But we also see in Acts 9, like Barnabas led forth Paul to the apostles, right? Paul was a persecutor of the early believers, and he converted, and none of the apostles actually believed that his conversion was true, so... Barnabas, who realized it was, brought Paul, led Paul, or presented Paul to the others. Hey, this guy really did see the Lord. He really did get it. Get it. He is true to, he's a believer with us now. So it is an event. This bringing forth, this leading forth, this presentation is an event. So when does God bring, lead forth, or present Jesus Christ to the world? 2 Timothy 4.1 I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing that is his epiphania even his kingdom he is going to judge the living and the dead at his kingdom and second, or in Colossians 3.4 we have a verse that almost says exactly what 
the other our passage in Thessalonians states when Christ who is our life is revealed when Christ is revealed is manifested is made known to the world then you also will be revealed manifested made known with him with him in glory so with what we saw back at Thessalonians we see here that Christ and the believer are brought forth together in glory. So you see the aspect of that Thessalonians that God will bring with him, with God, with Christ, those who have fallen asleep in him. So the kingdom is God's leading forth of Jesus Christ where God presents Jesus to the world. This includes a resurrection of those who have died in Christ in the past. So this answers their immediate need of what happened to our loved ones who have died. And God is going to raise them up at the start of the kingdom. Now as we go on in this, we see verses 15 and 16. For we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now this phrase is actually separating itself from those past verses. And we will see why, and it will make complete sense when we are all done here. We say to you by the word of the Lord. So Paul is moving on, or the Holy Spirit is moving on to another event that is equally magnificent. So now that we've separated 13 and 14, we want to see what the Lord, additional information that the Lord has for us. We say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the parousia of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So we see here that this event moves forward to the parousia, the second coming, the start of the second coming. The parousia is the start of the second, starts at the second coming. So we're moving on to the start of the parousia with the with the coming of the Lord, and we see that we who are alive, I'll touch on that in the next two verses, but will not proceed, those who've fallen asleep. So he's talking about another resurrection coming up here. The Lord himself will descend. Notice it's with a shout and with with the trumpet of God. And there is a resurrection here where the dead rise first. So we can see that... A secret coming is impossible. This is not a secret. There is a resurrection. We've already noted at the second coming, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 23, and Revelation 20, verse 4. We know that two parousias are impossible. So, verses 17 and 18. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so we shall always be with the Lord therefore comfort one another with these words so here we see that Paul and his co-authors must be alive when this event occurs because of the word we and it's not only emphasized by the word being attached to another Greek word That word we is single on its own in the Greek. So it is a separate word. We who are alive, it's emphasized. The Holy Spirit could have used a different word, like they who are alive and remain. That would not include himself. That would not include his his co-authors. If he said they who are alive and remain. But he's saying we who are alive and remain. He must be alive at that moment. And how can he be alive at that moment? He was resurrected in verses 13 and 14 at the start of the kingdom. So he's resurrected at the start of the kingdom and living throughout the kingdom, and he is going to be alive at the start of the parousia. And that's actually an extra detail that Paul and his co-authors do not die in the tribulation. He is not part of the tribulation martyrs. He will actually be alive. This is actually even further proved that Paul and his co-authors are alive at this point because of the use of those in verses 15 and them in 17. They, 
separating himself from those who have died, from they that are dead. He's separating himself from that, saying, I will not be dead at this point. Will there be a rapture? It depends on your definition. Some people are going to be airborne at the second coming. They're going to go up in the clouds and to meet the Lord in the air. So yes, you will have people who are going airborne. But to meet the Lord in the air, I want to talk about that word meet. It is the Greek apantesin. And this word always, always, always means going out to meet someone and accompany him back with you to his journey's end. We see this in Matthew 25, 1. The virgins, they go out to meet the bridegroom and they accompany him back to his location. You see this in Acts 28, 15. The Romans go out to meet Paul. They meet him before he gets to Rome. Where is he going? To Rome. So they accompany him back to Rome, even though they just came from there. These people are not going off to heaven because it's at Christ's parousia. Christ is coming to earth. So they will all go out to meet him and they will all return to the earth. And they will always be with the Lord because he is going to be personally present for the thousand years. The Thessalonians, so as we look back at all these verses together, the Thessalonians should receive comfort from resurrection. Those dead in Christ before the kingdom will be raised for the kingdom. Those dead in Christ during the tribulation will be raised for the parousia. So just because death comes in, you will not miss out on the blessings that God has for his future redeemed. Now as we move on, we see the Holy Spirit's linkage to 2 Thessalonians 2. And we should not miss this. Because the Holy Spirit links 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. So here, let's look at this verse by verse here. Verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So, he just talked in 1 Thessalonians about the parousia and the gathering together to him, where, where you meet him in the air. There can be no doubt that Paul is speaking about his previous letter's resurrection comfort. Verse 2. That you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So they have these Thessalonians have received a false spirit, a false message, and a false letter from Paul that claiming to be from Paul that stirred up their emotions and brought confusion. So Paul, ultimately, he did end up signing his name in a lot of his epistles after this to confront false letters written by him. But we also see him clarifying exactly his previous teaching. Verses 3 through 5. Let no one deceive you in any way. So don't be deceived. For it will not come, the parousia will not come, unless the apostasy comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? Paul is restating his previous teaching. And he's emphasizing there are events that must precede the day of the Lord. There are events that must precede the parousia. Can the rapture happen at any moment? Being in my past, having connections with and believing the premillennial ra kingdom rapture, premillennial rapture. They have this saying, perhaps today. Perhaps today the rapture is going to happen. Perhaps today, perhaps today. Can that be true? Can the rapture happen at any moment? No. There must be presents events that precede it. 
On a side note, the restrainer of verse 8 is the Holy Spirit acting in the kingdom. As I was reading all these rapture articles in preparation for this, they were saying that that was the church. And no, that is not the church. That is the Holy Spirit acting as restrainer. There are events beforehand. 1 Thessalonians 1, what's an event? The leading forth of Jesus Christ, which includes a resurrection at the start of the kingdom, comes before the parousia. 2 Thessalonians 2, there is the rebellion against God's kingdom, the apostasy. You have the appearance of the Antichrist. You have the appearance of the temple of God. And you can't just build the building and call it God's temple. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Psalm 127.1 God has to be reigning over to label that, be the constructor, be the engineer of that building the temple. You can't just build a building and call it God's. We see other events beforehand in Matthew 24. We already looked at verses 1 through 3. 4 through 8. Jesus answered and said to them. Who's he talking to? The disciples who asked him what the sign of his parousia was. So he's going to tell them signs. And he said, answers them. See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Don't ignore the personal pronouns here. Do not ignore these. Because how can these personal pronouns be true? The disciples have to be raised before the parousia. When are they raised? At the start of the kingdom. So you see that they are alive and living during these signs that the parousia is coming. And they should not be misled. They should not be hearing and deceived by people who are coming and saying, I am the Christ. Notice, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. How can that be a sign? We've had rumors and we've had wars and rumors of wars throughout our entire history. The only reason that is a sign is because they have stopped. It has been a time the kingdom has been a time of peace. <coughs> See to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes. How are famines and earthquakes signs? Unless you have the kingdom where there is no famine, there is an abundance of food, the earth yields its produce, you have a time where there's no earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. So don't ignore the personal pronouns, and there must be times of peace. Verses uh, 15 and 16, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through the Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand that those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. So you have the Antichrist setting himself up in God's temple, setting himself up in the Holy of Holies, and when they see that, all those who are in Judea, the governmental district, are fleeing to the mountains. So these are another two things. More passages about our second coming. And this is hopefully where we are going to bring it all together. In Zechariah 12 is a passage about the Lord's second coming. We see the enemy's problems. So in that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness. But I will watch over the house of Judah and strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. So here we see that the riders are struck mad. They're struck crazy. And the horses are struck blind. That's, what, that's some, some of the enemy problems that's going on. Well, the Lord's army, what's happening with the Lord's army? The people are in power. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And, no, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, right? They've been living in a time of peace where God has destroyed the knowledge of war. Well, guess what he's going to do here? He's going to take those weak and feeble, and he's going to turn them into like David, 
like a mighty warrior. So he's taking the weak and he's turning them into a mighty warrior without learning war. He's, and if you're in the house of David, will be like God. So if you are strong and not feeble, he's going to make you like a warrior like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So the weak are made strong and the strong are made like God warriors. You might not have thought even about this event that comes in Zechariah 12, the great mourning of verses 11 through 14. In that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself. So the parousia starts, the thousand years starts with a great mourning. Mankind is just rebelled against the Lord and the greatness of his coming. You don't think of that when you think of the second coming, do you? That when he comes back, he destroys that enemy army. You think it would be a time of celebration, but no. Mourning begins because mankind actually rebelled against God and against the greatness of his kingdom. Zechariah 14, uh, verses 4 and 5. Here's another passage. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from the east to west, forming a great valley. So here we see Christ comes down, splits that Mount of Olives open, and it forms a great valley. You will flee by my mountain valley. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So we see that the people flee through that valley. So his feet stand. They flee by the mountain. Does this resemble the parting of the Red Sea, right? Where you have the people, they're up against the water. God parts the water. The people flee through the water. What does Pharaoh and his army do? They flee through the water and to their death. This would be the Lord separates the mountain, the people flee through it, and the Antichrist and his army pursue to their death. Seems like it. When we look at Zechariah 14, 12, 13, and 15, this is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. On that day, people will be stricken by the Lord with a great panic. They will seize each other by the hand and attack one another. A similar plague will be on the horses and mules. So they are rotting, visually rotting within themselves that you could see to the eye. And they are in such a panic that they start infighting. They start killing their fellow soldiers. And the reason why I would think so is because they're looking at this other Lord's army coming at them and they want to get away. And these guys are in their way, so they're trying to run away and they're killing each other, trying to flee. We also see, before we had seen the Lord coming with his holy ones, so we want to talk about that. Revelation 12, 1 through 6. I, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in great pain, for she was about to give birth. Here we see that the woman is Israel. The twelve stars, similar to Joseph's dream, gives birth to a child. And this is in pain and is about to give birth. This is the great tribulation that is being described here. So this woman, or Israel, is giving birth to a child. And I have recently, even studying all this out, believe that this child is the overcomers of the tribulation, the 144,000. We see that Satan is ready to devour this child. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. Her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of 1,260 days. We looked at that 
yesterday with men. So we see that this male child, the overcomers, will rule the nations. And the child is snatched up to God. Is this literal? Seems like it would be. Seems like it's a logical thing to think from this passage. If so, this would indicate another rapture. You have people, the 144,000, being snatched off, caught up to God in heaven. But, take note, neither is the traditional view of the rapture. Neither one of these is. 1 Thessalonians 4 is not the traditional view, and neither is this. After that happens, the woman flees to the desert, the wilderness, where the Lord takes care of her. This is the mountains of Matthew 24, 16. We see in Revelation 19, 14, And the armies which are in heaven clothed with fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So who is in this army? Angels? Yes, because they're descending with Michael the archangel, right? I don't think Michael's there alone. And the 144,000? I think so. So I think you'd have angels and the 144,000. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of these saints. Now that we've looked at all those, we will put them all together. I hope you're in anticipation. But before we do that, I want to answer quickly some mangled passages. Now, because you are thinking, wait, what about this passage? What about that passage? Because I haven't touched on all the rapture passages, especially not all the ones that they bring up with. So I took some of the most important ones, brought them together, and I'm going to talk about them and address them right now. So the first one is God's wrath being poured out in the tribulation. And you will hear people who believe in the rapture saying, we are saved from God's wrath. We are saved from God's wrath. That doesn't mean he has to take you off the earth to do it. The Israelites in Egypt are actually the scriptural precedent, right? That God was making a distinction as he was pouring out his wrath on the Egyptians while the Israelites were right next to him and not experiencing God's wrath. The scriptural precedent is they can, God can make that distinguishment. <laughs> Another thing you, you'll hear about God's wrath, is you'll, you might hear like the mark of the beast. Like, oh, you have to receive the mark of the beast. You have to receive it or you can't buy or sell. We're going to starve. That everybody's going to starve in the great tribulation. <laughs> Because you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast, right? Well, try the kingdom way, right? What have you been doing the past hundred years? What have you been doing the past couple hundred, right? You haven't been buying or selling. Christ in his kingdom has wiped out the money supply. We thank, thank goodness, right, that we won't have to worry about money. But those rebellers bring back, right, Daniel 9, bring back the marketplace, they bring back buying and selling. So what's the kingdom way? Well, you can grow your own food, eat your own food. You can trade. You can, you can barter. Right? I mean, with the earth yielding its plenty, we can all be gardeners. It's not going to be toil. It's not a big deal. But they make a big deal about it because they don't realize the premillennial kingdom that exists beforehand. Or 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52. This contains the twinkling of the eye. You might think, oh, that's another passage. It is incorrectly linked to the rapture. Inheriting the kingdom is entering into it. This passage describes how it will happen. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So at the start of it, flesh and blood cannot inherit it. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We're not going to go into the kingdom with our perishable bodies. Behold, I tell you a mystery or a secret. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling eye, at the last trump, at the most important trumpet, God is going to change us. Our mortal bodies will be turned into immortal bodies. We also see in John 14, in my father's house, right? They use this for heaven. They actually also use this for the rapture. This is talking about the temple. My father's house is the temple. 
house and temple are used interchangeably a thousand times in scripture. Just look at the hundreds in Chronicles and Kings. And it, it has that comparison even in John's gospel. He is talking about the temple, not heaven. And he is preparing the disciples for a place in the many dwellings there. Right? The temple has many buildings. And people are going to be residing in these temple buildings. David is going to be there. Right? Probably Asaph, the singers of old, raised from the dead. And the disciples are going to have a spot there. So those are some of those passages. So now, the moment we've all been waiting for, putting it all together. First thing we have to do is possible past comparisons. Say that three times fast. Possible past comparisons. David, running and hiding from King Saul in the wilderness. David was protected by God and couldn't be found. Remember that verse in Revelation 12 that the, wo the woman ran to the wilderness and was protected by God? Well, not only is she supplied with food and water for that three and a half years, but David runs from Saul for all those years and couldn't be found by King Saul. But you have Jonathan, who Saul can't find him, even with search parties going out. But Jonathan, his son, walks right out to David and has conversations with him. Ever notice that? How can the Antichrist and his army not find the woman? You, he has to be searching for him for these three and a half years. He wants to kill them. He goes after her other children. So what's going on? Same comparison. They can't, he can't find him. How come Saul couldn't find David? The Egyptians, we already talked about this comparison, chasing after the Israelites after, after the Exodus. They were blocked by the pillar while the Red Sea opened up and the people flee through it. Pharaoh and his army pursue and die. Same thing with the Antichrist here. So, let's review. Christ comes back with all of his angels. The 144,000 overcomer saints, I think so, to the Mount of Olives. This could be the reuniting of mother and son of Revelation 12. The Mount of Olives splits in two. Those in the mountain flee away. So they flee through the valley, right? Now this is my one add-in. that I don't have a verse that says this, but I'm thinking from 1 Thessalonians 4, those who are fleeing need to be turned around. We who are alive and remain, I believe Paul will be in those mountains, will be caught up. So they can't, can, so they'll be fleeing, then they will be airborne to meet the Lord in the air at his second coming. So they're going to be fleeing through those mountains, be airborne, turned around, and that. But remember, the dead in Christ rise first. So as Christ comes back, splits that mountain of olives, they're fleeing through. The dead are raised, anyone who's dead in the tribulation, are raised up to meet him. And then they're turned around, and they are meet. They meet the Lord, those who are alive. And remember, they are empowered into mighty warriors. And I have their reinforcements. I mean, I know this army doesn't need reinforcements, but you kind of see this, like the you have... Armageddon, where the Antichrist and his army are gathering forces. Well, here is the Lord gathering his forces, the reinforcements. A civil war begins in fighting among the enemy army. They are visually rotting away. The entire army is destroyed. The Antichrist and the false prophets are interrogated. They are tossed alive and destroyed in the lake of fire. The other, all the other ones are tossed dead into the lake of fire. The battle is over, and the parousia starts with the great mourning. They look on whom, on him whom they have pierced. Those resurrected from Revelation 20, and those who are returning from Revelation 12, co-reign with Christ. So. As we conclude, raptured with Jesus, what have we learned? The parousia is God's term for the thousand years, and it, it means personal presence 
for who one is and what one is. Who and what one is. There can only be one parousia of our Lord. A thousand years. There are many prophesied events before the parousia, like the premillennial kingdom, the tribulation. There is not a traditional view of the rapture, but the 144,000 might be taken up to heaven mid-tribulation. And some will be airborne when Christ returns for the final battle. So that would be two different raptures, but neither one is the traditional view. Do I believe in the rapture? I don't know. Depends on how you define it, right? So many things is like that. Does it all matter? All this stuff, does it all matter? Yes. These are amazing, important details that we are privileged to look at and ponder. We are privileged to open the words of the living God. But, ne but God never put all the details together for us. He didn't take Zechariah 12 and put it together with Zechariah 14, with Revelation 12, with 1 Thessalonians 4, with, with all these things. God never put those details together for us. I believe that I will be living and able to watch these events unfold in the future. I will be raised in the kingdom. I will be alive for this event. I can be preaching about God's grace and how amazing he is, that we, there shouldn't be rebellion. There is a greater rapture that the scripture tells that I have not brought up until this point. Webster's definition of rapture is a state of being carried away with love, joy, or ecstasy. This is the greater rapture that I hope all of you will be participating in. I don't know if you'll be in 1 Thessalonians 4 rapture. You won't be in Revelation 12's. But this one, all of us can be in. And I pray that you are. Let's see this greater rapture. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. They asked the Lord, what is the greatest commandment? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That sounds like a definition of rapture for me. Being carried away with love for our God, for our Savior and Creator who has done everything for us. So please, be captivated and raptured in your mind for Jesus Christ and his love. Do not miss out on this rapture. It is by far the one that matters. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I pray this for myself as well, that out of all the details that we have here, even in this talk, that each and every one of us comes out encouraged to love you more and more and more, that we can be captivated by who and what you are and how good you are to us. So please, Lord, do that for every one of us here as we long for it on a daily basis. Please, if we don't even long for it on a daily basis, make us long for it on that day-to-day -day basis. Amen.